Hello, everybody, and welcome to So Very Wrong About Games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, and with me is my dear friend, Michael Walker. How are you, Walker? Fantastical. I'm glad to hear it, much like the Yeti or the Wildebeest, two made-up animals. So this is a board gaming podcast about board games, and we are very, very careful about what commitments we engage in and what partnerships we engage in. More on this later during the news, and we're very happy to remain independent, but we would like to announce our new sponsor, our new sponsor, Chocolate Cake. Chocolate Cake, how's your day doing? It could be better with some chocolate cake. You may wonder, what about our previous sponsor, our inaugural sponsor, your mom? She's a classy lady. Well, guess what? Your mom might be able to bring you some chocolate cake. So with that in mind, this is a board gaming podcast about board games. We're going to be talking about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And then we're going to talk about our topic this week, which is bluffing games. Or is it? Who knows? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. So Walker, what'd you play this week? Well, first we're going to do our retro segment of the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. Oh my goodness. I'm so I, unprofessional. This, do, you know, do you know how much I'm salivating right now that I get to to correct you for a change? It's just, it's just I, I need a second, I need a tissue. It's like, it's dripping onto my shirt. One I moment. assure you that when I do the final edit in this, it will be I who sounds professional and you who sounds incompetent. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. So exactly one year ago... Before we go on, Walker, we have to talk about our as-yet-unknown retrospective intro segment, the Eurus. Uh, 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 you're an awful person. <laughs> it was Kalis, 1303, Mark. It was our game of the year, that particular year. I know it was up in the air, and I think, I think even reflecting back, because... Uh, the game that it was butting up against was uh, King's Dilemma. Yes. And we played right through the whole campaign. And I think even, I don't want to say because we played through the campaign, but my reasons why I didn't want to put it at Game of the Year held, right? Because I just don't think that it is a game for everyone, mm. for every group where Kalis is. I think it's a more game that will please more people. I have not returned to it, not saying that I haven't wanted to return to it. There's just been so much new stuff coming in and other stuff around, and it's not in my own collection, so I haven't played it myself. But this was an uh, an iteration of of original Kalis, but with uh, special powers for that you could earn throughout the game that would change up the game a little bit, and they changed up how you placed workers. It cost you more workers as opposed to money. I think they did a great thing with this game. What do you think, Mark? What are your thoughts? I've played Kalis 1303 only once, sadly, since we reviewed it. And that makes me disappointed because, like you, I have a great deal of affection for it. I would take issue with your characterization of Kalis 1303 as a game for everybody. It is a very mean worker placement game. And that is not necessarily an intersection where everyone would like to stay. I agree with you that it is probably more accessible and for a wider audience than, say, The King's Dilemma... But Kalis 1303 was our compromise pick. I wanted the King's Dilemma to be game of the year. I still think that it was the game of the year at the time of. But, you know, partnerships are difficult when we work through these things. Kalis 1303 is absolutely one of the best worker placement games of the past few years. I And I also think that it's an improvement over the original Kalis. The thing that I most like about it is that it is streamlined without losing that fundamental head-to-head -head competition and meanness that makes Kayla such a delight. So... So we'll agree to disagree on that. Kalis 1303 is still an excellent worker placement game. Highly recommended amongst a sea of dross. That is the game we reviewed exactly one year ago. I can't believe you wanted to forget that, Walker. Now, onto the game embarrassing. we played this week. But first, Mark, you've just had dinner. You want just a little bit more. Moist chocolate cake is the meal for you. Mark, what did you play this week? <laughs> so played more Regicide, as per usual. I'm very glad that Regicide is now catching on with a slightly broader audience. I hear a lot more people talking about it. It's now gotten to the point when I see people talking about Regicide, they're like, I'm playing Regicide just like everybody else in the world. So that's great. Congratulations to Badges from Mars. I would, however, like very much for other listeners and other reviewers to stop rubbing our faces in the fact that they have won a game and we have not. You can stop being jerks about it. Just because we haven't won Regicide doesn't mean you get to say, oh, well, you know, people told me it was hard, but I won my first... Shut up. Don't want to hear it. <laughs> Just enjoy the game. Move on. Enjoy the game with the, with, with the app. There's an app 
that will keep score for you. It's a very interesting. I played around with it a bit. You can have it on the table. And because the player aid is only one-sided, you could have it to, you know, the information side. And you can have this nice app that t- takes care of the enemy hit points for you. Stop rolling your eyes. Is counting to 30 that difficult? It's very difficult. Okay, sure. Uh, more power to it to people who love the app. I revisited some other consistent favorites here in the swag catalog, played a game of Shards of Infinity, played some Rhino Hero Super Battle, introduced it to somebody who initially thought they were too good to dexterity games, but we had a fine game of Rhino Hero Super Battle, as well as another fantastic game of Kabuto Sumo. I've been having a great deal of fun trying out all the different Rikishi, which is to say the different sumo wrestlers, and all the ridiculous jokes that are labeled in to all these bug characters, along with bug facts on the back. It's practically like Wingspan Walker. It's as scientifically valid as Wingspan. Why won't the Audubon Society get behind Kabuto Sumo like they should? And <laughs> They're afraid of fun. And so that was just a quick roundup of some of the games I've been talking about rather frequently over the course of the past weeks and years. Just as a reminder in terms of disclosure, Kabuto Sumo and Regicide were both review copies that we got from the publishers. Since you brought up Shards of Infinity, I'll just go over my little bit. Uh, Chip the Third and I have been playing it a lot because we went back to the co-op where you play against bosses. You and I had tried it, and we beat the boss, did we not? Because I remember we, did. we got punished fairly badly when we were playing it just the other day, and I said, I know Mark and I played this. I wasn't sure if we had won, but I was, I was thinking that had we not won, I'm sure we played it again immediately in order to rectify that. And it's a great system because I'm sort of – because the very next day I introduced him to Star Realms, correct? You know what I mean? It's sort of like the the intro to this factional sort of comboing uh, deck building sort of system where, you know, you have all different colors of factions that you can sort of have a theme to your to your deck build, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Shards of Infinity did rip off the Realms games rather shamelessly. It's true, but uh, so, did, so did others, like, uh, you know... Uh, Clank in space and Clank and eh, all of the others. Sure. I, I would argue that Shards of Infinity, when compared to the Realms games, is one of those instances where it would have been very classy of them to at least involve some knowledge in the rulebook. And also, I there was also, I'm probably just overreacting to the fact that the people behind Shards of Infinity, uh, J- Gary Arant and Justin Gary, wrote this incredibly self-congratulatory designer diary a few years ago where they talked about all these very intractable problems in deck building that they miraculously solved by using all the same mechanisms that white wizard had introduced before sorry wise wizard they're now called yes well i can't see ultra pro saying that they ripped off anybody but that being (laughs) said the star realms sort of co-op boss system is is very thin right you just sort of draw a card and and you do what it says whereas the shards of infinity has multiple mechanisms that you get to work through and, and interesting, you know, ways to actually focus on beating it. You know, it's not just sort of play your own deck and hope that you draw well. It's actual things you can do to, you know, compensate. So you saw that and just that huge mercenary thing in Shards of Infinity where you can buy cards right off the line and not bloat your deck. And that is a stuff genuine like innovation and I do give them credit for that, yes. Love it. And that's all I'm going to say, because I keep talking about Shards of Infinity. I apologize, but I'm just loving it. And more on that later, because I'm, I, uh, yeah, go ahead. And you'll be getting the expansion soon, so you can keep enjoying my coffee while I'm away. Damn straight. Yeah. Played another game of Root, and this is just a testament to how much I appreciate Root on the topic of our past games of the year. Root is one of those games where I will absolutely snatch up any and all expansions that are available, love all the additional factions, love the variety they bring, love the alternate maps, love the alternate deck, and as I've mentioned before, I've also gone to a fabulous Etsy seller and replaced all my counters with lovely little plastic pieces. But when locally there was a chance to play Root, three players with no expansions at all, no expansions, like a savage. Jeez, did you even remember how to go back to... <laughs> back to the olden days, back to the before times. It was very nostalgic. It, it made me feel like I was back in 1903. Anyway, so played Root with three players, namely the original three, uh, three of the original factions, Birds, Cats, and Vagabond. And I was initially worried, you know, I was like, am I just the person who's a slave to the cult of the new? Is my FOMO so bad that I'll be able to appreciate three of the vanilla fight? It was a great time. I love Root. Root is fabulous. What else is new? Got to play as the cats for the first time in a long time. And I was actually, I was surprised by how well the cats were able to capitalize on the absence 
of the fourth player. It, it was it was strange. I was expecting there to be uh, too much of the birds just hammering me constantly because those are the two traditional military forces, and I thought that the Woodland Alliance would have been necessary as kind of a, a third military power to sort of provide a bit of a distraction. But it turns out that the Vagabond, in that context, can serve that role. So there was the traditional military lines being drawn by the two traditional large army factions, and it worked out surprisingly well. I've never played Route 2 player, but it made me think that I might want to might want to give it a try, and it might be surprisingly good. But, I mean, what do I know? My copy's in Kingston. I was going to say, Route 2 player would be a much tighter. You definitely have to have two players that know what they're doing and how to, like, counter each other almost immediately right off the start. It's true. But suffice to say that I came in with some misgivings that were really unfair. I mean, my enthusiasm for Root is such that I ought to have given it enough credit. It's just that in my head, especially with the rest of Cole Worley's oeuvre, for what it's worth, his games are often very, very fragile. And so I was worried about the player count. I was worried about the lack of expansions. I was worried about this, that, and the other. I needn't have been. It was a lovely, joyous experience. And I thoroughly enjoyed going back to Root. And I look forward to doing so as often as humanly possible, with or without expansions. So now that we're able to game with people, I'm introducing the locals to games that we played over the last year that I thought were fantastic. Uh, Mainly FAM. What a fantastic game. Oh my god. Freedom Freeze brings out this... Uh, Euro game where you have this hook that you're managing your deck. So you're going through your deck, you're going to get bonuses if you use all of your cards, but then you only get three back and then after that you have to pay more and then you're deciding what order to play them in because you want the ones you don't want anymore on the bottom because you're going to have to constantly cycle that, that discard back into your hand and so you're trying to get you're trying to get enough combos and it's timing at the end because you got to know when the game is going to end. You got to do that final recycle and have enough scoring opportunities in there to keep you in line with everyone else. And there's so many different cards. The, the mechanisms, mechanisms are very interesting. The like minimalistic sort of tokens and how the board looks, it all just comes together in a package that really appeals to me. Love that Friedman freeze. And that's Fayum. Got to try Descent Legends in the Dark. So this is Descent 3rd Edition. This is the recent release by Fantasy Flight Games. I don't know if you're familiar with Fantasy Flight Walker. Uh, They were a game publisher about five years ago. It's paid hype. This is paid hype. Yeah, but now they're mostly involved in churning out LCGs and shifting all their assets and intellectual property over to other subdivisions of their corporate overlords. So I assume, Walker, you're somewhat curious about Descent Legends in the Dark. Do you have any questions for me? Did you have fun? Yes. I came into Descent Legends of the Dark with no expectations. I really didn't know what to expect, to be frank, because, again, Fantasy Flight doesn't really publish new games anymore. And, again, my experiences with the past Descents have been various shades of meh. I'll comment, first of all, on the physical production of the thing, because it's truly impressive. The quality of the miniatures is really taking another step up, despite the fact that most of the miniatures games have been offloaded to Atomic Mass Games, more on that later in the news. The quality of the miniature sculpting is is just a cut above. It's definitely better than what Simon produces. I remember the last time I was this impressed by a hobby game in terms of the miniature sculpting was in point of fact Gears of War, also published by Fantasy Flight. But technology keeps improving, and so these miniatures put a lot of others to shame. The box is also a bit of a triumph of engineering because there's all this cardboard terrain to to assemble. First of all, it assembles it like a dream. I've assembled a lot of cardboard terrain over the years, either through miniatures games or tabletop games or hybrids in the past. And often it's very, very difficult to do or it's not engineered properly. This is done fabulously. It's wonderful. Even someone with my ineptitude at assembly was able to get it done very quickly, very easily. And it looks very, very impressive. And there's an entire section of the box, an entire box section devoted entirely to storing the terrain. So everything fits back in the box, which is great. Now, it's a huge box. I'm not going to say it's a small box, so they've done a marvelous job with the insert or what have you. But the engineering has been very, very carefully considered at all stages. And then there's the app integration. And I think there's a lot more to be said about this, and I don't want to get sidetracked into a whole 20 minutes about app integration. But for the first time, I got a very strong question arising to myself while I was playing, which is, why isn't this a video game? 
a lot of people and a lot of gamers have various thresholds that they hit and they say, this should be a computer game. This shouldn't be a board game. My friend Josephus often says this. The moment there's a lot of arithmetic involved, he he says, why, why would I bother doing this when I could play a similar thing or the same thing on PC? You know, things like Food Chain Magnate or things like the 18xx games. Now, a lot of people play those computer-assisted because they don't want to have to deal with the math by themselves. Then there's the whole Gloomhaven issue. Do you play with helper apps? What kind of helper apps? What needs to be unmodified? This, that, and the other. And as you well know, and as I've been very clear in the past, I tend to have a rather minimal hand with respect to integration. Anyway, as I say, this is a topic unto itself. But the app integration and descent is half brilliant and half really intrusive. The brilliant part is it is allow it allows you effortlessly to do things like crafting and getting recipes and getting this amount of widgets it's to be able to form this kind of haft that you attach onto the weapon, which has a 20% chance of procking and doing extra damage. You know, things that you could never do in a board game before. The part that's really obtrusive, though, is that it manages absolutely everything except the physical location of the miniatures on the board. This includes attacking. If you'll recall, in Imperial Assault or Second Descent 2nd Edition, the app would tell you when enemies would spawn, and they would also tell you the, the AI behavior of the enemies, but as far as attacking them, you were in exclusively in charge. Now, in order to attack something, what you need to do is you need to drag the portrait of your hero over to the thing you're attacking, tell the app what weapon you're using to attack of the two that you have, and then telling the app how many successes you roll. And then it tells you how much damage it does, and then you go back there. Whoa. That's the step too far for me. It's at that point where it happened, and I figured, no, that, what, what, why? Why am I doing this? The, the problem for me primarily is the divided attention. I'm constantly looking back and forth between the beautiful physical presentation of 3D terrain pieces and lovely miniatures and this weird app screen where 90% of the actual game is occurring. Now on the topic of the actual game, just to, just to round up my comments. It's fine but it doesn't really leverage a lot of the things that I want out of a comparable game. I've been very clear in the past, and we talked about this last time, I think, with Bloodborne. I want, in my dungeon crawler slash kick down the door and murder everything kind of thing, to have some sort of clever activation system or some sort of interesting combat mechanisms. We, in other words, I've been spoiled by games like Gloomhaven and Assault on Doomrock. And just on that note, there are so many games in this genre. You, you point this out every time there's a Kickstarter. Is this going to be the next big thing? Is this going to be the one that finally obsoletes all your other ones? Probably not. But we, in regular rotation, we play things like Gloomhaven, Assault on Doomrock. We play Street Masters. We play Too Many Bones. And all of these games, to varying extent, have clever combat mechanisms and interesting little ability puzzles that you get to activate and do combos and nifty things. In Descent, Legends of the Dark, most of the time what you do is you move next to the monster and you hit it twice with a hammer. And I'm over that. Honestly. Like, you know, you roll your d6 to find out how many successes you do on the target that's adjacent to you. Wash, rinse, repeat. Now, I will say that all the other stuff, all the extraneous bits outside that, is beautifully well done. One of the things the app does that really is, is excellent is it allows the narrative to kind of breathe. I've never been half so interested in Terranoth as I've been during playing Descent Legends of the Dark. It's character-driven, Walker. I say the same thing every time there's a narrative. I like my narratives character-driven. The narrative here is character-driven. It's amazing. Every character has two driving ambitions. And at various points, you have character options about how they're going to respond to various inputs. And I really feel like I have a sense of agency, and I really can get to know these individuals and like them for the most part. The problem is, when it comes time to them actually doing stuff, I get a little bored and distracted between the board position and the app. And I, I, I mentioned Bloodborne before because I really want to emphasize this. When we talked about Bloodborne, the thing that I said was I like the combat puzzle, but everything around the combat puzzle is incredibly dull. Moving from place to place, activating items, setting up the scenario, etc., etc. In, in a very real way, Descent Legends of the Dark is the opposite of that. All the stuff surrounding the actual gameplay decisions is really well done. Character-driven storylines, crafting that's taken care of by the app, scenario management that's trivial, equipment management that, that's done really, really well, beautiful, beautiful terrain pieces that are a joy to set up. But the actual combat decision-making, eh, incredibly dull, incredibly simplistic, and stuff that we've been doing for literally 40 years in the hobby. So that's the story that I have of Descent Journey uh, Legends in the Dark. Am I going to keep playing? I don't know, I'm kind of curious to see 
how the characters evolve. I want to see a little bit of payoff of that. And that's really unusual. The last time I really cared about what was happening to characters in a story that wasn't a tabletop role-playing game was, in point of fact, Legacy of Dragonhold. And I think it's telling that when Fantasy Flight reaches out to design teams that are from underrepresented groups that aren't, you know, 15 years in the traditional either consim background or tabletop background, or who've been doing the same thing over and over, like Christian Peterson or Corey Kaneska or whatever, you end up with some really good storytelling involving underrepresented styles of characters. And by the way, F off to all the stupid trolls online who looked at the characters and said these characters don't quote-unquote look like heroes. I know exactly what you're saying. The dog whistles loud and clear. You're not, you don't want non-binary characters and women of color being in heroic roles. I get it. Why don't you move along and, and go back to the 18th century where you feel more comfortable? But I have to say that Descent Legends of the Dark, all told, I've talked a lot about it, but there's a lot going on. It's interesting as a product, but I, I really feel that the core gameplay loop, the fundamental gameplay loop is, is a massive letdown. And it's also, let's acknowledge, really really pricey. It's a very expensive product. And it sounds like it has a huge setup to like gluing all of that train, punching all that train out and manipulating it all into its little pieces and getting it all ready for that first play seems like a huge deal as well. I w uh, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I was surprised at how well it was done. Like I said, the physical presentation of everything is extremely well done. And when compared to other games, even games we really like, not even remotely fiddly. Yes, there's some assembly. It didn't take me long at all, especially when compared to lots of other games. But in a universe where Gloomhaven exists, in a universe where Street Masters exists, and Too Many Bones, and all those other excellent games, and Doomrock is going to be coming out with another edition soon. And when you look at something like Doomrock, where it's literally a third or a quarter of the price, and you get such interesting tactical decision-making... Is it a game that I that, that I really want to go back to? Uh, like I said, kind of, because I'm curious about the characters. I just wish they'd done a little bit more about the core gameplay loop to, to bump it up a notch. So, if you know somebody who's got a copy, by all means, give it a try. It shows you perhaps where the future might be going, unfortunately, both for good and ill, in terms of high-priced, app-assisted games that do a lot of the periphery really well, but drop some of the fundamentals as far as the fundamentals that I care about. Is it going to find an audience? I don't know. We'll see. It's been a very controversial, divisive offering. And that's one of the reasons why I desperately wanted to give it a try. And I'm very glad I did. But as I say, all the periphery done really well. The fundamentals mm, kind of leave me wanting. Well, the other thing that I heard that I don't think is very much of a spoiler is the fact that in the old sense, they had like a plethora of characters you can choose from, like dozens and dozens. This one came with quite a few, but even at the beginning, it doesn't let you choose all of them. Eventually, as you go through the adventures, it unlocks other ones, and it's all part of the story. And I thought that was very interesting as well. I, I can forgive the relatively parsimonious number of characters because of all the customization options that exist for each of them. And because, as I say, we finally get character-driven storytelling. You can't have a massive cast like Gloomhaven's cast of over a dozen different classes if you expect them all to play salient roles in the story, unless the story ends up being incredibly generic. And as I say, despite the fact that I've never found Terranoth interesting other than Legacy of Dragonhold, it's really quite surprising to me how much I care about these characters and I care about this setting. And this is a, this is a bit of a minor spoiler as well. The extra characters, they don't take long to get unlocked. So it's not like you're going to spend a whole lot of time waiting for them. It's certainly not like Gloomhaven at the rate that they introduce new characters. So all told, there are six characters, and I don't really feel that that's too few because they're very strongly differentiated both in terms of skills and equipment and in terms of narrative. So as far as the overall value proposition goes, again, in a universe where you can get Gloomhaven for half as much money, Doomrock for a third as much money... I don't know, it depends on what you're looking for. And I've tried to be as clear as possible about the ways that Descent Legends in the Dark is a step forward and the ways in which it is not a step forward. I, if the gameplay loop had, were slightly more engaging, I would say this is a genuine winner and it would absolutely be worth your time and money. As it is, as I say, more of a judgment call. That's a, as a segue, I want to jump in there because you say gameplay loop. Let me talk to you about Dark Souls, Mark. Dark Souls, the campaign game. And what a loop that is, because <laughs> what it does is, is, is sets out six 
big squares and these are the different battles that you're going to be fighting. And what the game wants you to do is cycle through these multiple times. It wants you to feel the grind that is the video game. So it wants you to, because there's no way you can even come close to killing the big boss off the beginning, you need to mill that weapon deck. So you fight through a couple of rooms and either you get killed and start again, or you decide, well, you know, we've cleared out you know, most of the rooms, we're definitely not strong enough to kill that boss. So let's reset everything, start again, do the exact same rooms over and over again yep. until you think, hey, I think we got a chance to kill the boss now. Let's go do that. So I don't know why, why they thought board gamers would enjoy this. I don't, even, I don't even think that people that like Dark Souls would like this. But it is what it is. It's It's very much like any uh, any computer game that's like that, you're cycling through this weapon deck where most of the items are useless to you. And finally, you might get one that you like and you're leveling up your skills. Parts that I do like is that when you fight the room for the first time, there are strategies that you can understand. Like we are going to start in this corner because these guys only move one and we attack before this other unit does. And you get to know that. And it would have been, would have made more sense if they just let you go on a path like that. Because when you got into a new room, it would have somewhat of the same characters. So you could say, well, I know what they do. So we can sort of try the same thing, not the exact same room over again. And it's the same thing with the boss. All the bosses are unique and have their own mechanism. And it's much like Mario, where you have to sort of feel your way through the first couple of rounds, see what they do and manipulate the boss, much like we do in Kingdom Death Monster, right? They, they have a deck that they go through, they do their abilities and you sort of try to manipulate the monster around and try to take as less damage as you can. So I, I highly doubt I will return to Dark Souls. This was designed by David Carl, Alex Hall, Matt Hart, and Richard Loxham, and it is put out by Steamforge Games. It was a huge Kickstarter. Haven't heard of it since. Dark Souls, I think, is the paradigmatic example of hardcore fans of the original who defend it on the strangest grounds. Because I keep hearing in the back of my head the Dark Souls apologists who are like, yeah. You go through the same room over and over grinding, but it's just like the video game. It's like, yes, but this is a classic example of when you're adapting a property, you might want to, you know, be a little more creative with the source material so it doesn't end up feeling like a ridiculously repetitive grind. Sometimes I feel it might be as though it's uh, video gamers buy their first board game, right? They like Dark Souls. They've seen, oh, they have a, a board game. Oh, I'm going to buy it. It's their first one. And as, as you've seen, as we've witnessed in the past, the the first game someone buys, they will defend it to the very end, regardless <laughs> of what it is. I got to play a game called Warp's Edge. Warp's Edge is a solo game de designed by Scott Alms. Uh, don't worry, this is not a tiny epic game, because we are spokespeople for Tiny Epic Delusion Awareness, the TED Foundation. Tiny Epic Delusion kills 750,000 Canadians every year, Walker. It's a terrible disease. We have a friend that suffers from this very badly. We've all been touched so by we this. we understand. Yes. It's, it's tragic. Anyway, but it turns out that Scott Alms can design something amusing. Warp's Edge is a game that attracted me both mechanically and thematically. Thematically, it's about a lone fighter craft fighting off waves and waves of alien ships and killing a mothership. In other words, just like all the side-scrolling and vertically-scrolling shoot-em-ups that I love to play. And mechanically, it's a bag builder, and I will always try a bag builder. It's unusual in its bag building because it, unlike traditional bag builders, like your Orléans, like your Hyperborea, you're not pulling out elements that are then going to power recipes. It's instead a bag builder simply because you would shuffle too much if it were cards. You can easily do it with cards, but you just have to shuffle too often because every time you gain something, it doesn't go into your discard pile, it goes straight into your deck. And what this allows you to do, actually, and, and the ways in which it's kind of interesting, is it plays with your understanding and intuitions about things like trash and about deck size. Because most gamers who've played a lot of deck builders have very strong intuitions about you don't want to buy crappy cards 
and your deck should probably be lean, or at least you don't want it to bloat too much. Warp's Edge subverts that in a number of interesting ways, and I found that really clever and uh, an interesting change of pace. The reason why is because you have a certain number of warps to kill the mothership, and the warp ends when your bag is depleted. So already you have an incentive for your bag to be longer because it prolongs the game and gives you more of an opportunity to succeed. It is also the case that enemies attacking you will be stunned if you do any damage to them over the course of a round. So that trashy one power shot is good enough to stun that massive, incredibly frightening ship that will otherwise do tremendous quantities of damage to you. And so getting crappy discs is advantageous in some senses. Now, you're still limited by your hand size. You still want to be able to effectuate combos. You still want to have better quality chips in order to do more impressive things. But it's subtly different from the way a lot of other deck builders work. So I found that overall very interesting. I enjoyed playing it. It, I don't know how much depth it has. It has a lot of variety, but I, I, having only played it the once, I can't comment whether the variety is just of the superficial type or of the substantial type. Lots of different ships you can try playing. Each ship has its different market of what ships it can acquire. Different motherships, you get the idea. So I will probably go back to Warp's Edge if given the chance. I have a fair degree of enthusiasm for solo games, especially interesting bag builders. And the theme definitely doesn't hurt. So I am keen to try more of Warp's Edge by Scott Alms, published by Renegade Game Studios. So you and I got to play a game together. This is not a lie, nor is it fake news. We played Alien Fate of the Nostromo, and it's a new game by Ravensburger, and it's a cooperative game, which is very much a sort of maximize your actions, puzzly type game. You look out at all these different objectives you have to do, get items at different places, and so you sort of break out as a team and go on your own little separate miss- missions and try to meet up in different places, all the while trying to manipulate the alien and and round, and you know like lure him to different places so people can do their jobs or just try to keep him away from everyone. Uh, I think we were cheated. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because obviously in normal circumstances we would win and not be eaten by the alien so i think we did something wrong but other than that i think it is a great experience i'm not sure how much replayability it has i'm not sure if that simple puzzly mechanism you know will be keep me interested i'm not sure what did you think Well, I think you should submit your grievances in the form of a session report to support at aircanada.ca. I I have a number of thoughts. I was looking forward to trying this because it's it's gotten some good feedback from people I trust. It's basically a pick-up-and-deliver game. It is make this widget, bring it to this place, or everyone show up to the same place and satisfy these, these goals. So on the one hand, I'm not terribly keen on investigating the other mission objectives because they all mostly take the same format. Just different widget, different place, different bring conditions. But that's okay. That's fine. Pick up and deliver games are, are a, a, a solid genre and some of them I enjoy. The part that I didn't like and I strongly objected to and this is actually going to be evocative of some of our discussion of Dark Souls, was several ways in which the game seeks to make you lose a turn. Not proactively. There are games that make you lose a turn proactively. Like, I play this card on you when you're stunned and you get to skip your next turn. Alien Fate of the Nostromo made you lose turns reactively. Twice. Now, th- th- this is unusual. This was a freak occurrence, and I'm not going to blame the game too much for this. Twice in a row, I spent my entire turn moving somewhere... And then I pulled the encounter card that says, go back to the med bay. And I had started from the med bay twice. Now, this was very true to the movie. Because if you'll recall, there are vast stretches in the the Alien movie where it's just some combination of either bureaucratic complications, lack of resources, or active interference by conspirators that causes people to have to go to some place when they were just about to do something interesting. And they get called somewhere else, so they get scared, and then they run... Anyway... So I was impressed both at how thematically evocative some of this time-wasting was, and simultaneously, number two, how little that made me appreciate the actual gameplay. I will also note that thematically, this game is a clear ripoff of Nemesis. I mean, I'm 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 appalled at how they just took the, the brilliant IP of Nemesis and just ripped it out wholesale. This is embarrassing, and they should be ashamed. It's fine because Nemesis ripped off, you know, Space Hulk. You know, so <laughs> it all originates from Space Hulk. That's, that's so. a good point. That's a solid, solid point. 
I liked how accessible it was. I liked how in I liked how much cooperation was required. We were constantly talking to each other and trying to give feedback about what to do. But so you know, be careful about people who have very very strong quarterbacking issues, of course, as per usual. And I liked its pacing and I liked how quick it was. But it's just there were a number of different ways in which the game caused there to be stalemating. So one of them I already talked about. You, you pull an encounter card, you get just sucked back to some arbitrary location. Well, the med bay. And the other problem is that the alien didn't feel threatening. The alien just felt like a roadblock. You could retheme Alien Fate of the Nostromo to, tr- to make it about trains, and it would take absolutely no design effort whatsoever. Because it's just a rail blockage. It's not even really... <laughs> it's not a threatening thing that's going to chew your face off. It's like a giant security cone saying, you know, no entry. And so... <laughs> The f- it did have a couple of rough patches too, like all those missions where everyone has to meet in the same room, and one person is like, and a couple say, in our case, it was a, a few people that were just one action away, so they get there with one action, and now they have like two or three actions left. Well, we're just going to run in circles because, you know, because mission. Part of me thinks that was worse with five players. We played with five. I don't think that's the ideal player count. With three or four, I think that would be a little bit less obnoxious. Not necessarily easier. But a little less obnoxious, because again, the more players there are, there's the more opportunity for the, ah, teleport back to someplace you don't want to be card, which makes everyone convening together in the same place extremely frustrating. So it was, it was nice. Like, like for a mass market game that's available at Target, I thought it was pretty good. For a licensed property, it was pretty good. Would I want to go back to it? Probably not. If somebody suggested it, I'd, I'd be willing to give it another shot. But I found a lot of it reasonably frustrating. And the thematic elements that were evocative of the film were the, uh, you know, dull drudgery elements. But I didn't get sense of being stalked or any sense of, of active threat. True. The one theme thing I did like was the cat carrier <laughs> and the cat tile. That's true. Right? That was funny. Was, and 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 the fact that the mechanism is like you're get you you're flipping these tiles and there's an alien tile. Alien tiles are bad, but there's a way that you could remove one of the alien tiles because one of them had a cat on it. And if you just happen to have the cat carrier, then in went the cat to the cat carrier. And now that tiles out of the game. I just thought that was a cool little, you know, mechanism to have in there. And I have to agree with the designers of the game, a xenomorph with multiple jaws that has acid for blood and is borderline invincible is definitely scary, but almost as threatening is a cat hissing at you. Because a cat hiss is the, the the most naked form of aggression that I have ever seen in the natural world. So, good on them for that. So, so true. Mark, I got to play lots. Remember lots? It's a Kickstarter. It was very charming. So much envy. Only played it with two player. I do not think that is the ideal player count, but it does play just like I thought. You, should, you think you You're should play it, out... it with, with, with lots? Yes. Lots of players for lots to be lots of fun. So what you're doing is you're putting out these decks of colored cards, and then on your turn you're either adding objects to these lots, or you're taking the cards to show that you have interest in that lot, and then once certain game-ending things have occurred, like some cards missing or or a certain number of things are locked down, in which case it means they've got four or more objects underneath them, then the game will end, and then you sort of check these uh, m- uh, modifiers or integers that you've put in between the lots. Either one has to be greater than or less than or equal to or way more than the one previously. And then if if the integer is correct, then you get uh, points equal to the number of cards you have in that lot times the number of objects in that lot. And I think it was anything that comes with like a single sheet of paper for rules and you can pick up almost immediately and play in, you know, 10 minutes. It's a great little game. And just the pieces alone are so charming. It's literally like, like we said, when we talked about before, he's like dumped all his extra gaming bits into a bin and sort of just, you know, took a handful out and thrown it in each box. Everyone gets a a mitt full of used game pieces. I love it. Finally, this is the the promise of a unique game that is not just tedium like Discover Lands Unknown. This is a fully unique, bespoke, individualized game experience where the differences are actually pleasant and intriguing as opposed to just another way to be bored. I am so jealous that you got to play lots. Finally, for me, I got to play Mandala. Mandala was, as you know, a very famous politician and civil rights leader from South Africa. No, wait, no, that was Mandela. 
Mandala is a game involving stones and wooden bowls. No, wait, that's Moncala. Sorry, I just love the form of that joke. Uh, by the way, the other form of joke that I've been seeing lately that I love is I used to have a joke about X, but Y, about mythology. Like, for example, have you seen any of these, Walker? No, yeah, a long a while ago, yes. My favorite one I think that I've read recently is I used to have a joke about Zeus and Athena, but it was a real headache. Get it? Get it? it anyway. It's so, very clever. Mandala is a two-player card game. It was designed by Trevor Benjamin and Brett J. Gilbert. Trevor Benjamin is the co-designer of the Undaunted series with David Thompson, uh, the latter being one of my favorite designers. And I have to say... Having now tried this design, co-designed by Trevor Benjamin, and I really, really enjoyed Mandala, it really makes me want to go back to War Chest. Trevor Benjamin is also the co-designer of War Chest with David Thompson. I never really liked how the endgame worked in War Chest, but I have such respect and such appreciation for the output of the two designers involved. I should really go back to it after a year or two with fresh eyes to see if I'm able to appreciate it, because they put out such quality work. Mandala is a two-player card game. I've heard Mandala explained... A couple of different times verbally by people. The first time actually by Quinns at Chuck's when we did an episode of Sorry Wrong About Games there with him. And every time I've heard it explained, it has made precisely zero sense to me. But now I'm going to try to give some sort of explanation about how the game works so you can understand. There are six colors of cards and there are two fights going on. It was it was analogized by the person who explained the game to me as being not entirely unlike Air, Land, and Sea. High Praise, the card game by John Perry in that you have to decide where and how to fight and decide when to cut your losses and give up. The reason why is because you're engaging in these two fights at the same time, and a fight is resolved once all six colors are present in a given fight. And whenever you play a card, you can either add it to your side to help win the fight, or you can add it to the pot. You Your opponent, of course, has their side. You can't play to that side. And the dynamics that this results in are made further tense by the fact that the color can only be represented once in a given fight. So say we're fighting over a pot of a couple of blacks and a couple of red cards. What that means is neither of us can play red or black cards to try to win this fight. You show up first with a green and play a green towards that fight. Well, now I can't play green towards winning that fight either. I also can't put green into the pot. And so as time goes on, you get more and more constrained about how you're able to contest a given fight. And that part really, I thought, upped the tension considerably. I enjoyed it a great deal. It's also got some scoring shenanigans, but at that point, I think if I tried to explain that, I'd get into full-on, I don't understand what you're talking about. Long story short, cards you win later on in the game are worth more points, but you have fewer opportunities to win them. And it's really engaging, really simple, really quick, and super, super tense and confrontational in a sort of subtle laid-back way that Euro games often are. I don't want to like just call out to what we're talking about later on, but it seems as though there'd be some interesting bluffing going on there, like hinting that you're going to play a color, forcing <laughs> your opponent to play that color that you don't have anyway. You know, that's sort of like interplay. At I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. There are definitely cases where you really don't know what the opponent has, but there's not a whole lot of, lot of opportunity for misdirection. It's more a function of just being able to lock down a conflict whereby showing up soon enough that you can make it so that your opponent's options are, are limited. And you can definitely end up in a situation where there are five colors present on a fight and you don't know who's going to pull the trigger and you desperately want that sixth color so you can end it or you desperately want the fight to keep on going longer. So there's a bit of that. There's a bit of playing chicken rather than bluffing is what I would say. So high praise for Mandala. I definitely deserves the plaudits that it's been getting from many corners. It is a lovely, simple, accessible game with a, a lot of tension and a lot of trade-offs. I'm looking forward to future experiences. And as I said, the sheer quality of the output of Trevor Benjamin and of David Thompson makes me want to go back to War Chest because I guess, huge fans of Undaunted, massive fans of David Thompson's solo output, and Mandala is an, uh, another winner. And I don't think either of us have tried the War Chest expansion yet, so that would be something, another reason to go back to give it a try. Eh, I guess. And of course, also credit to Brett J. Gilbert. Here, here's the problem. I don't ever want to make it seem like I want to give these co-designers short shrift. It's just I have more experience with Trevor Benjamin than I do with Brett J. Gilbert. I'm sure Brett J. Gilbert is a very, very talented guy, if for no other reason than he co-designed Vandala. It's just, again, in terms of pedigree, I'm more familiar with one of them. So if you're listening, I'm very sorry, Mr. Gilbert. Also, if you're listening, why? Why? That's a great question. So two last ones for me very quickly. Got to play Canvas. This is sort of in the same vein as 
Mystic Veil, where you're putting these translucent cards into these sleeves, but in this case, you're creating works of art, and you're creating them in a way that they satisfy these different scoring objectives. And there are five slots along the bottom of all these translucent cards, and they're all set in certain colors. So you're trying to make sure that you have certain symbols and the colors in the right places because you only can use three of these per painting so you're trying to make sure you have the a bunch of different scoring objectives in each painting and so you're either taking more cards or you're painting a painting and it just cycles through like that you get three paintings that you can paint throughout the game all trying to satisfy the same scoring scoring objectives moves along at a great pace it has like a a a running line of cards you choose from and it's the same sort of system where you have uh, some tokens that you place along the track to say you know I want the one fourth so you put down four tokens and then if someone takes an earlier card then they get these tokens and it lets them skip cards in their turn type thing thought it was a great little game looking forward to playing it again and this is designed by Jeff Chin and Andrew Nurger and put out by Road to Infamy Games and lastly Rush MD. Mark, you played uh, Kitchen Rush, correct? Only the once. Only the once, but this this is about 15 times better. There's Ooh. like a, a, Because in Kitchen Rush, all you're doing was like sort of manipulating components. It's like yes. you move it from here to there, and then you move it onto the plates, and then you... But that's basically how medicine works, right? You're manipulating a lung. You know, the lung needs to be over there. You slap it in. in but in this case, you need tweezers, so you're like... you're. In, in especially in our case, someone's chasing the heart around the table trying to Walker, pick it up with these tweezers. Walker, don't be stupid. You can't use tweezers to pick up a human lung. It's too big. You just uh, use your hands. Uh, this is what happens. No, can't use your hands. That's that's against the rules, Mark. And you're also filling little syringes, like actual syringes with these little cubes because, you know, that particular patient needs three doses of red. So you're putting three doses of red in the This thing game does not sound very realistic, Walker. And then, and then you're doing all these other mini games because they all need different tests. This guy needs a head scan. This, this woman needs a, 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 a head scan. And, you know, it's like going through cards, trying to find one that, that does not have a certain symbol or flipping up tokens, trying to find the right symbol or trying to balance your hourglass on the, on the edge of the bed, all these different mini games going on. There's this sounds like awesome. A, it is really good. There's like a quick little outpatient at the bottom where you, you know, you're doing quick medicine, just a couple pills and out the door. And then there's the heavy surgery at the top where everyone's got to use tweezers and be very careful. And you're, and they all go in these beds where you're like, you know, you can load in all the stuff so you know, you know, who has what. So there's not this craziness sliding off the cards like there was in Kitchen Rush. Looking forward to playing it again. Now I wish we had actual influence. Because if I could convince them to include in an expansion a mini game involving an ethics consult, this could possibly be the greatest game ever. So good. And that is Rush MD, designed by Anthony Oh, I'm going to destroy these names, Mark. It's they're all right. Anthony Horgio, Constantinos Kanaikis, and oh, David Tertze. Put out by Artipia Games. Love Artipia Games. So many games of theirs that I enjoy playing. And those are the games we played last week. Now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So first off from me, it has been a great joy and a great pleasure to serve on the jury for the International Gamers Awards. The initial round of voting has completed, and so now we have the shortlist of nominees. There are too many to go over, but it's a fine list. Of course, we don't love all of them. That's what shortlists are for. The final round of voting is going to continue until September, giving us a little bit of time to catch up on the games on the list that we haven't played yet. But I am very enthusiastic about this process, and I very much look forward to the results. And I'm going to post a link in the episode notes to the list of nominees. Yes, many games to play. Looking forward to seeing what I should vote for. So two things for me. We, like I t- already talked about, Star Realms, uh, Hero Realms just had a Kickstarter for a digital a- uh, adaptation, and they have... Uh, the beta out, I played it on Twitch today while doing some unboxing stuff. Uh, it It's great so far. It's actually leveling up. It has, you know, uh, you know, lets you add cards to your deck and sort of slowly build this thing up. I'm looking forward to playing it over and over again like I, like I do. 
And lastly, Warlord Games has announced a game called Blood Red Skies Battle of Midway. And there's these fantastic little squadrons of fighters fighting in Midway. Little little thing here, because in none of the pictures do they show the unpainted plastic that you're going to get. And only in like the last paragraph on something you have to click on does it say... Britain is represented by the blue plastic and Mm. Japan is represented by beige plastic because all of the other pictures and everything else shows fully painted fighter squadrons. And I had to like search, you know, because it's like, oh, this is great. These look great. They come pre-painted. It doesn't say pre-painted. It doesn't say does not come painted. And it was like, okay, well, at the bottom, it's like, okay, well, that's kind of (laughs) rough. But other than that, it looks like it's super interesting. They say the thing that caught me, Mark, was the fact they said a full... Uh, fighter combat game in under 45 minutes. So we'll see. Blood Red Skies is a system that has already been out for a little while. I, too, have been wanting to try it uh, because air combat I find conceptually interesting, even though the period of history is not necessarily my preference. Yeah, the whole issue about miniatures supplied, unpainted, and unassembled, a lot of it is about manufacturer expectation, right? So this is being marketed primarily to board gamers, but nonetheless, the company involved is a miniatures company, primarily. And so from their universe, it's entirely normal that miniatures come supplied unpainted, but that you market them shown painted. You know, it's the same thing for, like, any Games Workshop product. You're always going to see those miniatures painted, but you assume, or at least you and I do, because we know Games Workshop, we know they're a miniatures game company. We know that they come unpainted, so we we expect that. It's a weird th- sort of expectation and communication. I agree with you that in a perfect world, these things would be a little bit more clear and transparent at all times. Quick news from Atomic Mass Games, the subsidiary of Asmodee that was supposed to handle the miniatures games properties that used to be Fantasy Flight, QV, the continual gutting of Fantasy Flight as a board game publisher. Two of the properties that they were supposed to continue supporting were X-Wing and Armada. Well, recently there's been an announcement from Atomic Mass Games that they have finished publishing the expansions for Armada that were designed by Fantasy Flight, and they have no intentions of designing any more. They say, maybe more later, but uh, I think the writing's on the wall. I hope to be proven wrong. And the claim is that the exact same thing happened with X-Wing, that everything that Atomic Mass Games has published was just the stuff that was designed by Fantasy Flight before the holdover was finalized. So, so far, we have Atomic Mass, who was basically dumped to massively, at times successful, long-running miniatures game series, beloved of many fans, and they don't appear to either know or be able to know what to do do with them. So let's hope for a brighter future, but it really does look like everything that Fantasy Flight was involved with is being either handed off or being killed explicitly. Well, that's what you get for being uh, up to Asmodee's height and when they get your their hands on you and dismantle you piece by piece and take away everything you ever loved. <laughs> Whoa. Then things got grim. Finally from us, by now many of you have probably heard of the recent account of a former Broken Token employee credibly accusing the CEO, Greg Spence, of, among other things, stalking, emotional abuse, and sexual assault. We at So Very Wrong About Games stand with victims of abuse in any sphere, but especially within our hobby, and we will not purchase any Broken Token products going forward. We applaud the decisions of publishers to sever financial ties with Broken Token, including Cephalofair, Bazir, Yello, and others. One thing I feel like we can add, though, is how utterly bankrupt and indefensible some voices within the hobby are when they call for neutrality, or worse, siding with the abuser. This mealy-mouthed, faux-judicial presumption of innocence exists only in cases of marginalized people being victimized. I have seen many, many times people reporting having been victims of theft, fraud, or other crimes, and openly requesting financial support as a result. And we do not hear in those instances let's wait for the other side of the story, or they're just doing it for attention or money. When those latter claims show up only in cases like this, where a woman tries to call attention to assault, we reinforce the hopefully false notion that this hobby can never be a safe space for women and other marginalized groups. And that is the news and why sometimes it does matter. Now moving on to our topic this week, and our topic this week is bluffing. And Mark, there is 4,341 games listed on Board Game Geek under <laughs> bluffing. And we will now list all of say, them. And number one, 10. <laughs> 10 is a great card game. <laughs> 
<clears throat> but that being said, going through, you know, you know, like uh, clicking through some of the, the games very quickly, they seem to draw a very fine line between push your luck and bluffing, like almost, you know, it sort of like merges together, you know, if you what, know what I mean. Give me an example. Sort of like in, in like an auction game, you know, where uh-huh. you sort of, or or even in, in Skull, where you like sort of set the the starting price. It's a little bit of a bluff. It's a little bit of push oh. your luck. You know what I mean? Where you're like setting the price really high and, you know, it's a little bit of bluff, push your luck type thing. And you can see sort of like the melding of, of those and some of the games they've chosen to put in this bluffing category. That's a really good point. I guess any game, it doesn't even need to have an auction system, any game where there's iterated bluffing, you are effectively pushing your luck about how far you can get away with lying to the same person, about how long you can take the same bluff or the same story or the same. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I'd never really considered that relationship before. So I sort of broke broken down, at least I have broken down this bluffing thing into three main categories. It's like an actual bluffing mechanic in the game, okay. in the rules. Then there's sort of implied bluffing. You know, like, you know, you sort of, mm-hmm. it, it's sort of implied in the game or is it bluffing or is it cheating? <laughs> Could we start with that one? Well, I do have a couple things sort of like, um, in, there's a Scrabble thing, you know, where you, where you can, uh, put down a word that you oh, know wow. is not a word, but they might call you on it. They might not call you on it. Oh my goodness. That's a really good point. And then there's some things that I may or may not be guilty of. <laughs> <laughs> sort of like... I love this topic already. It's been about 30 sort, seconds, but you're already blowing like, my mind. Sort of like in, in Scythe, where, you know, someone's about... Like, your turn's just about to end. And you know someone's probably... Go- they have a movement. They haven't used their movement action. So more than likely, you look on the table and they're going to attack you. So you just sort of nonchalantly pick up your... Uh, combat cards, and you sort of look over at the thing. It's like, how, how many fives are in the deck? I have... Okay. Right? Other yeah. things other things that I am not guilty of, but I, I shouldn't say that, may be guilty of, or have seen happen, where you do sort of like a head fake, or you reach for something, knowing you can't do it, or, you know what I mean, you sort of make it action to do something, mm. where it's like, oh, wait, I'll do that next turn, or, you know, sort of like you know, pretend that you were going to do an action that you know you couldn't do, that you know you didn't have anything of, but you sort of make it look as though you could. That's fascinating. Those performative elements, to me, they're kind of on a spectrum where sometimes it's it's pretty overt, right? Like, So let's let's keep with your scythe example. I, to my mind, there's a bit of a difference, and I'm not, I'm not going to go so far as to say that one is o- definitely okay and one is definitely not okay, but there's a difference between looking over at somebody and saying, do you think you could beat me in a fight, and then both of you just start to posture, right? Obviously, that's that's calling for a performance that's, that's being explicit. On the other hand, if someone's, you know, just moving their units around, but you think they might make a play for your area or you're sitting on the factory or something, and then you just start making an ostentatious display of what, by whatever means of your, your combat cards, whether it's just like, let me count all the combat cards I have, or how many five, or in your example, even worse, how many fives are in the deck. That, to me, in many tables, would be very, very antisocial behavior. In our tables, it would be fine, because we trash talk all the time. That, that to me, is like a cousin of trash talking. Like, yes. trash... Sub, subset of trash talking, the, the open bluff. So, like, I have one written down here, which I know I've used. It's like, uh, how does ambush in root work again? How, do, how does, <laughs> you know, while looking at my hand of cards, like, it says ambush. What, is, what does that mean again? Like, well knowing the, what the rules are. Like, asking for a rules clarification when you know what the rule is, but you just sort of want to let on that you have something that you don't actually have. I have no idea what I think about that. Where That's you know there are certain where you know there are certain action cards because this because this really would happen a lot in these combat fighting games yes. right where you're really trying to anticipate what your opponent has and you could just sort of lean on something it's like how does counter work again or <laughs> how does you know these things you know you can sort of just sort of bluff that you have certain cards that you do not have you you de- I I hope you agree with me that in many tables that would be supremely jerk-faced behavior. <laughs> oh, yes, 100%. Okay, okay. Uh, but, I, but still I, very I, funny. 
<laughs> Reminds me of a comment that my history teacher in high school used to always make, which was, Ce n'est pas gentil, mais c'est drôle. That's not nice, but it's funny. Uh, which, you know, can sometimes be true. Yeah, I don't know. That, that seems... Outside of an environment where aggressive trash talk is understood to be the norm, I would venture to say that in some cases that could be borderline, I, I, I'm being very careful, borderline cheatery behavior. Yeah, if I'm playing with strangers and I start to initiate an action that I know I can't do just to communicate something to the table, or if I s- pretend to not remember a rule just so I can communicate something to the table, that to me, and I'm completely unable to explain why, crosses a line especially if you know the game and you know the other players are struggling to learn it or don't oh, know yes. it as well as you that makes yes. it even you know a hundred times worse yes but it comes from a, but it seems to me though despite the fact that i have this intuition that it's unacceptable in many contexts it seems to have a good pedigree because if we think about in many ways one of the paradigmatic bluffing games in the western ken and poker it is common in poker to pretend to be less competent than you are, or less confident than you are, or more confident than you are. And so, now maybe this is just me, because I, I haven't played poker seriously ever, but I'm familiar with some people who have. I have a couple of friends who actually was one of their primary sources of income for a few years playing poker. And it is perfectly reasonable to manipulate table talk in those environments, whether you're playing with friends or whether you're playing with opponents. Now, some things you're not you're not supposed to do. Like, there's etiquette, of course. There are limits. Y- yes. But under the general category of deception, there's a lot of things you're allowed to do. So it's true. Yeah, I- anything goes in Texas Hold'em, one hundred percent. With <laughs> like what you said, but within the guidelines of the game. Right. Right. It, it actually reminds me, minor sidebar of one of the analyses I used to present when I was teaching ethics, because there are a whole bunch of moral theories, most of the correct ones, I would argue, that are moral realists, which is to say the, the, the edicts of morality are not culturally dependent. And people would always say, well, that's obviously wrong, because what you're allowed to say in some contexts is different from others. And the response to that is, no, 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 let's be clear. If you're a Kantian and you think lying is always morally wrong, which I do, The question isn't, well, is it okay to lie in some cultural context? The response is, well, it depends on what you constitute a lie. What constitutes a lie is, of course, linguistically and culturally determined. Like, somebody who has no idea, an alien watching a game of poker would be like, well, clearly humans enjoy lying to their friends to bilk them of money. No, that's not what's actually going on. Bluffing in poker is not really a lie in the same way as a false promise. Anyway, it's a... But you're bringing up very interesting issues about how that same paradigm could be imported into other game contexts. And it seems clear to me that that poker-like bluffing does not belong in games like Scythe. But again, I couldn't defend that. I don't know that I could explain why. So now that we're on that sort of topic, what what is the... Why are bluffing games so popular? What is it about bluffing that appeals to so many people? I, I couldn't get it. I was like, I thought it was like that, that big, I got you moment. Like I, ha, I tricked you or, or the fact that you're sort of play acting or, you know, you're practicing your poker face, or like I said, it is a little bit of lying. So it's, you know, sort of silly lying or, you know, like white lies type thing, or, you know, practicing and being completely aloof, you know, things that, and this, this, I think this is a, uh, a bluff that happens in almost every game where there's a particular action, like if it's an action selection where someone's taking a token or someone's taking a worker place that you really want and you just act aloof, like, oh, I, I don't want to go sure. there or, you know, <laughs> and and you actually do. I think that's a, a form of bluffing that happens in almost every game. That's a good point. My My theory on why people like bluffing games, and certainly why I like bluffing games, is it allows you to engage in a kind of improv that is not stressful the way that a lot of other improvs are. Like, I've seen people completely seize up while being told to do improv or tabletop role-playing. They, they don't want to say the wrong thing. They just don't know how to proceed. The same thing happens for what it's worth in games like Spyfall. Spyfall, I'm surprised that people uh, recommend it for, you know, mixed groups or groups of strangers. It's very stressful because everyone's staring at you and they're waiting for you to say the wrong thing. But in a bluffing game, It's very simple. It's just so primordial. You're just lying or you're pretending to lie or you're trying to suss out a lie. It's so basic and so atomistic and at the same time deliciously subversive. 
Everyone knows how fun it is to lie. We've all been children. We were all little monsters then. It's so fun believing, making people believe that which is not. You know something they don't. You understand the truth of the world and you've managed to convince other people of something else. And the converse of that, finding somebody out in a lie, it makes you feel like a genius even if you were just doing it by chance. These are simple universal joys, I think, and it's one of the reasons why bluffing games are so perennially enjoyable, especially, as a side note, with children. It's one of the reasons why we typically pull out skull or cockroach poker often when there's a, a, a kid involved. Other than dexterity games, I think bluffing games are just so 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 accessible in that way because of how socially primordial that kind of bluff is. Yeah, same with Sheriff of Nottingham works great with children too because they're yes. you know you're sneaking goods across you know past the authorities type thing you know they love that kind of thing. Yeah, it's like the most atomic form of role play. We all know what it is to lie. We all know that that sort of tension, that thrill of putting on a facade, but it, without the additional baggage of getting tripped up over a single word or deviated from the script or that kind of undue attention. So you get a lot of the same benefits, but without some of the same, uh, without some of the unpleasant tension. I totally miss, I have to go back because I totally skipped over one of my awesome bluffs, the the posturing <laughs> bluff okay. where you where you push your units like right up against the border of someone. <laughs> to show, you know, to, it's like, oh no, they're, they're just, don't worry about it. They're just sightseeing over here. They're not, you know, <laughs> they're not invading or anything. That's my favorite trash that talky. Bluff. Yeah, that that to me I think is more clearly in the trash talk element than the the the, the bluffing element because of how overt and and clearly ridiculous it is. So the rest I have now are mostly just sort of genres of games or actual games. Absolutely. So trick taking games, there's sort of a little bit of bluffing and sort of a little bit of trying to give information that you're not allowed to type thing. I don't know if it's about bluff. Uh, to my mind, it's. It's a close cousin to bluffing, because when you're bluffing, what you're trying to do is you're trying to manipulate the flow of information. And in trick-taking games, you're also trying to manipulate the flow of information. But there, it's just trying to be able to successfully communicate and interpret information given limited communication, limited data. I don't know if but that's a distinction without a difference, but it feels different to me. True, but sometimes you, if, if, you're, if you're versus someone, you could play a mid-card, hoping that they'll think either A, it's your lowest, or B, it's your highest. And there's that sort of... That's fair. You know, early bluff that you could do. And we've already talked about, uh, so we've played in a grove. This is an oink game where you're, you're, where you have, uh, unique information to you and you know that your opponents have limited information. Well, you have the same limited information, but you can push really hard on something and try to bluff them into making decisions that you want. And then there's all the hidden role games, right? Battlestar Galactica, Deception Hong Kong, Shadows Over Cam Camelot, Spyfall, Chameleon. You know, I can go on and on because I'm not big on into the, you know, the secret Hitler and the Avalon and the, you yes. know, the heavier social deduction games. But all of these have the same sort of, you know, trying to show that you're a particular faction that you're not, that you, you have information that you actually do not have that kind of thing. Just acting, uh, you know, more confident than you, than you really are. And allow me now to offer something that's a little bit intentional that I said before, because I, I do think that one of the joys of bluffing is how atomic and how simple it is, how, how primordial it is to social interaction. But by the same token, when it comes to social deduction games, I actually prefer when the bluff has to be a little bit more elaborate Namely, when we play the Resistance or the Resistance Avalon, you have to be able to, as a spy, give an account, give a story, give a narrative about who voted what way, who threw what and what mission, so that you're able to plausibly present yourself as a member of the Resistance. And that's one of the reasons why I don't really like Secret Hitler as much, and I certainly don't like the One Night games. Because in the One Night games, all that you have is what's called hard claiming. You just have to stipulate, I am this role, I am this person. And then you have somebody else saying, no, I am this person. And at that point, that's not that to me is not as entertaining a bluff. I mean, many people love that. Many people love just then I have to guess or suss out who's telling the truth. But when it comes to just hard claiming, not so hot. That, for what it's worth, is one of the reasons why I talked about this last week. The director's cut of Quest is absolutely recommended because the non-director's cut version just devolves into hard claiming. I'm the cleric. I know they're bad. I'm the cleric. I know they're good. Whatever. 
And the thing about Secret Hitler, and one of the reasons why the bluff there isn't satisfying to me, is because when you're when you're playing Secret Hitler and you're you're one of the fascists, it's always the same bluff. The deck made me do it. I pulled the I made a med bad draw. The deck made me do it, and that to me is not as interesting. When it comes to social deduction games, I would like the bluff to require a little bit more elaboration. So I'm going to go out on a limb here, and probably because you love the game so much, you might not agree. But I'm talking about deal making games like mm-hmm. Sidereal Confluence, where there's the negotiation phase and you have to make a deal sound better than it actually is. <laughs> oh, how cynical Walker. Would you say that is also sort of bluffing? I agree, but I don't think that Sidereal Confluence is a good example of this. Sidereal Confluence, no, this is, this is a subtle distinction and I think it matters because in Sidereal Confluence, I would argue that if you're in the business of routinely trying to sell people on a deal, you're not playing very efficiently. In Sidereal Confluence, it's been described, I think, very successfully by the designer as a cooperative game in which the person who cooperates best wins. And this isn't about being altruistic, necessarily, even if you're the space whales, who, by the way, operate galactic charities. That's a word for the yet. Love them, space whales. Probably my favorite faction. But it's about the quantity. It's the volume of transactions you do. The moment you plant your feet and start haggling, it's like, no, 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 but this green cube, look how beautiful this green cube is. It shines. It shines like justice. Your brown cubes are ugly and disgusting. But if you insist, I would take some of your brown cubes and maybe... No, no, no. If you're doing that, you're not playing fast enough. You're not engaging with the rest of the table in Serial Confluence. Now, there are lots of games where you haggle, like Genoa or even Catan or lots of other trading games where you have the time to really force a transaction. And I agree with you there. There is a kind of implied bluff because you would like your opponents to have a, a an erroneous conception of the good's value. I just don't think Sidereal Confluence is a particularly good example of that phenomenon. That's all. And you're wrong for not liking it. That too. That's the other thing I want to say. There you go. So Stratego, another big bluffing game where you're doing pieces against pieces and you're sort of trying to tell your opponent that you this piece is much more powerful than it actually is any game with aggressive fog of war you can absolutely engage in aggressive bluffing yes now when i was doing my uh sort of research on this diplomacy came up quite a bit and i'm I'm not i'm torn on whether or not this is actual bluffing and not just straight up negotiation versus lying well, right, anytime you're doing well, you, heavy negotiation, because like, what do you? When do you like actual posture or or try to bluff into something? You're just negotiating with people or straight out lying to them. You've never threatened anyone in diplomacy ever. Uh, uh, but it's such a, it's such a straight combat system that that there's no hidden information there. It's well, like I have the I have the ability to push you out. I guess I guess you could have. Uh, different. I suppose you're right. You could have fronts that are more important to you, and therefore you weren't really planning on attacking them, and therefore saying that you're, yeah, I suppose you're right. That part, I guess, is a bluff. The other thing when it comes to military games, and this is very successful, is you may have a very powerful military, but the problem is if you're communicating with different people, they won't necessarily know where you're inclined to commit, right? This happens all the time in Troops on a Map games, or even more subtle multiplayer conflict games. If I've got the biggest, baddest army, let's call this, I don't know, let's just pick a series of nonsense words. Let's call this the America problem. When you have the biggest, baddest military, you can't be everywhere at once. So if I go to one of my neighbors and say, do this thing or I'm going to kick you in the teeth, and then I go separately to a separate neighbor and say, do this thing for me or I'm going to kick you in the teeth, I can't kick both of them in the teeth. My legs don't split that far. But they don't know that. This is true. Sheriff Nottingham, we already talked about. Scrabble, we already talked about. Now that we've talked about, we went a little bit more in depth of the of the cheating slash bluff. I want to I want to touch on a little on this again because when I read this, it brought up some other things. Like so, we have Fury of Dracula or Nuns on the Run or hidden movement Ops, games. Yeah, hidden movement games. How about if if you sort of let your eyes linger on on part <laughs> of the map? <laughs> is is that is that also, you know, does that that does tie into what we were talking about before. Now, what what are your feelings on that? I would say that it is, and I frequently comment on this in particular games, it's a mechanical and component failure of a game like that. If it's too easy, if it's too easy to infer based on someone's physical mannerisms what they're doing, right? Like if you can figure out where Dracula is because the way Dracula has to play because they literally have to start manipulating components and tokens in the city where they happen to be. Obviously, that's a problem. You have cards and other components to hide that. 
I don't know too much about the converse. I don't know about so so there's like the value of just looking over the board and not focusing too much on a, on a particular place, but pretending to focus somewhere else. That's an interesting edge case. I'm not sure. All right. So one of the greatest games, I think, you probably agree, that has a bluffing mechanism, sort of like a military-type game with bluffing mechanism, is Battle for Rukigan that we've played somewhat recently. And I think yes. this, this does a fantastic job of bluffing on so many different levels. I would say that it is indeed exceeded by Senji, because Senji also has the hidden orders, where you get to bluff with respect to where you're going to be devoting your military might. But it also involves that beautiful diplomacy phase where you start trading your relatives away and you don't and and you can promise to your dear friend of course i will take care of your grandpa meanwhile you send the grandpa over to their military enemy yeah so any any hidden hidden order game can absolutely allow for right, i have so many more games so i'm just gonna stick to the good ones so i'll have to skip over dead of winter <laughs> well can i comment on one thing that some bluffing games do that i really don't like and there's one that so there's some games that are that are literally just bluffing games. That's pretty much what you're expected to do or, or how it's presented. And one of the most popular ones is Coup. And I have I have a very simple critique of Coup as to why I don't like it. I have seen far too many games of Coup end with the winner having played straight the entire time. I like it if a game is going to be focused on bluffing. I like there to be some penalty for people correctly identifying when you are telling the truth. As well as correctly identifying when you're lying. You know, like Cockroach Poker, like Hoax. Hoax, to my mind, is like Coup in that it's very, very quick, but much, much better because if you are if you just play it straight, if you play it consistently honestly, you can be caught out and, and you'll be penalized for that. Hoax, for what it's worth, was designed in the late 70s by the same design team as Cosmic Encounter and Dune. So obviously a bunch of visionaries who are well, well ahead of their time. Uh, if, you have, if you have an opportunity to try Hoax, I recommend it. Not the new Fantasy Flight version. The new Fantasy Flight version is not as good. The original Hoax from the 1970s. Well, the other thing that ties into this is that in the research I was doing, there was a whole article on Sheriff of Nottingham that showed just that. If you just play straight up honest the whole time, you have a more consistent chance of winning than you yeah. than you would otherwise, right? So it it, it it's true. I, yeah, I, I have that problem with Sheriff of Nottingham as well. I've seen it happen less often, uh, but... It, the only reason why I mentioned Coup in particular is just I've seen it happen over and over again, and I find it very, very disappointing. I've only played Sheriff of Nottingham a couple of times, but I can definitely see why it would be there's sort the same of uh, the blind bidding bluff, which happens in Game of Thrones when you're building on, when you're bidding on all the different areas of influence, and same thing in the Rising Sun combat system. Same sort of thing where you're just sort of trying to show that you're more invested in a particular battle than you know than than you are. So I sure. guess this this there's like the Sherlock Holmes clue sort of thing where you sort of try to infer that you have more information than you actually have and try to force your opponent to take an action that they normally wouldn't like in clue that oh next round I'm going to I'm going to solve the mystery so that might push people to try to solve it before you when they have imperfect information. Same hmm. thing with Sherlock Holmes when you when you move to different locations, they all have different information and try to, trying to infer that this particular spot had great information that, oh, oh yeah, well, oh, that's very interesting. And, you know, write a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff down that, you know, is just gibberish and hope that they waste a turn going there to get that useless information. <laughs> yeah, that just didn't occur to me because playing that game competitively seems like a waste of time. But anyway, that's quickly the game that I'm playing right now. It's Elfin Land or Elfin Boots, where you sort of there's all these different routes you can take, and when you're playing tokens down, you can sort of bluff that you're going in a certain direction, and then sort of switch around or use tokens that other people have already put down, and sort of just play off of them and and bluff your way that way is interesting as well. Or one of the greatest games of the past ten years, or indeed of any time, Nemesis, where you're bluffing that you're going in a particular. P- a particular way to misdirect all your opponents when in point of fact you're going a certain way because all you can do in the game is just desperately rush to where your victory conditions are and you don't have time to do anything interesting. I thought the bluff was where the person said that we're going to have fun playing this game and you actually don't. So there's a kind of bluffing game that very rarely works uh, but when it works it's actually really cool and that is where there's a bluff about what faction you're associated with. Uh, this comes up in a number of different games. Attila Clan's War of Whispers, for example, where you're you're siding with a particular faction, but people don't know that. And the implication is that you're supposed to take actions to misdirect where your true loyalties lie. 
And I often find, and this is true of those three games, the Teleclans and War of Whispers, it's just a waste of time. Like, you have so few actions available, why would I take an action that gives points to my opponent just so some of my other opponents don't know who I'm siding with? You know, the opportunity cost, it's kind of like games that don't allow for enough hate drafting. The opportunity cost of misdirection is so high that it's really not worth your time. Some games do it well. A couple that spring to mind is Mr. Jack. Mr. Jack, is a, a lot of that is about misdirection and manipulating information, but you're forced to move a large quantity of characters at once. So you get to move a whole bunch of irrelevant characters or less relevant ones in a way to misdirect what's actually going on. And then there's uh, a little bit of a shout out to an older game by Croc that you and I both enjoyed. Not perfect, but very enjoyable. Age of Gods. In Age of Gods, you it wasn't clear on the board who you're associated with, but there were enough factions around that you could afford to waste an action here or there to expand with a race that wasn't affiliated with you to make other people think that you cared. And so it did actually pay off for that. So again, very much like how we like fairy tale allowing for hate drafting because you draft five, play three in these games where you have uncertain military identity. It is good if you have a little bit of action fluidity, whereby the opportunity cost of misdirection is not too high. Yeah, there's a great old fantasy flight game called Quicksand that is almost exactly the same. There's all these adventurers that you're moving through all these different pitfalls and and crocodiles and swamps, but you don't know who is what adventurer and, and you're getting these hands of cards and you're moving everyone around. And it's like, oh, well, I only have these cards, so that's why I'm moving this person. Or So they're all sort of progressing slowly or you know, one's getting way ahead and then you start knocking that one back but it's the same sort of thing you don't know who's who and and then suddenly you know you're obviously who you are and you're trying to get them at the very end to uh to get to the finish line first i thought it was a great little game it's one of my first ones that i ever bought well that's going to do it for us for this week thank you very much for joining us for so bearing about games if you'd like to get in touch with us you can reach walker by his email just rolled a dice at gmail.com you can reach me mark bigney on twitter at the games you like for more public discussion you can find the so very wrong about games facebook page or you can check out our board game geek guild which is guild number 3236 and you can find us on patreon and twitch we read everything you send us and we'll get back to you if we can thanks again for tuning in and we hope to see you again soon peace you've been listening to so very wrong about games produced by michael walker and edited by mark bigney Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for Spike Presents, Mass Street Theater Presents, The Fast and the Furious Presents, Hobbs Presents, Shaw. Walker, what did you think of this film? I, I think if people had this much excitement in their lives, they would quickly have a mental <laughs> breakdown. <laughs> Poor Hobbs. <laughs> you know, he never gets... You know, a rest, a, just a small respite in between these crazy adventures that he's forced into continuously. I think it would just be a, a mental aneurysm would just explode from his, yeah, it would be oh, lights out. From the punching over. in the face alone. Well, I, I personally, Walker, was prepared to hate this, especially after F8 and the fact that the opening has a terrible cover of a brilliant Jim Croce classic. I think that bad covers are an act of violence on good music. It's one of the reasons why I never forgave Battlestar Galactica after what they did for All Along the Watchtower. But anyway, but big budget stupidities should be light on setup, light on exposition, long on character, and long on wit. And I think that this actually did a reasonably good job. The absence of his grace, Dr. Dr. Vincent, Duke of Diesel, OBE Esquire, is a bit of a problem, at least for me. But at last, we have a director and a writer who don't ask Rock the Dwayne Johnson to try to do things outside his very, very narrow wheelhouse. Parenthetically, Mr. The Dwayne, can I call you the? Professionalism, it does not, in my experience, consist in subtweeting about your bosses and or coworkers while calling them candy asses. Wow. I side with Vin Diesel. I'm on Team Vin Diesel 100%. Final note, though, for me, 
cyborgs are hella stupid in a movie like this wasn't necessary. He could have done all the things that he did in the movie, and the only explanation they would have needed, him looking directly at the camera, just shrugging and saying, I'm Idris Elba, what are you going to do about it? And that would have been fine. Cyber, a bridge too far. Less techno babble, the better. But that, that I, just, I don't know why he was in most of the scenes. Like, his motorcycle, you know, drove itself. Like, why did he even need <laughs> to be there? Because he's Idris Elba. He's amazing. Oh, my God. Thank you for joining us for Mass Beast Theater Presents, The Fast and the Furious Presents, Hobbs Presents, Shaw. Join us maybe next time to see if we have enough spoons and mental energy capacity to comprehend the enormity that is The Fast and the Furious 9. Thank you and take care. Bye-bye.